Let me begin by issuing a uh, disclaimer. Uh, this talk is not about the economics of welfare. So we're not going to discuss like government welfare programs. That's not what this is about. Um, uh, I mean, I mean uh, you've gone through enough of this already that you know that that's like shooting fish in a barrel anyway, right? I and mean, it's sort of obvious as to what the problems are involved in government transfer programs. No, this uh, talk is on a somewhat arcane uh, field in economics called welfare economics. Now, I say it's somewhat arcane just because it's been uh, kind of pushed uh, sort of into the background uh, for various reasons that we'll talk about uh, or at least mention as we go through uh, the discussion of this. Uh, but then on the other hand, it addresses a very important issue in economics. And so even though welfare economics may not be like a pr prominent part of curriculum in, in an economic uh, program in your undergrad department, uh, the issues involved are, of course, uh, discussed um, and are prominent. And the, the basic issue of welfare economics is can we as economists uh, construct a scientific analysis of social well-being? So is there a economic theory of the well-being of people in society? Is it possible to uh, make such a, uh, a theory? Or we could say this in a slightly different way. Uh, is there a justification uh, for just purely from the economic scientific viewpoint for public policy. What, what kind of a justification can be actually given within the confines of economic theory <coughs> for government policy? Now, before we uh, launch into the different um, approaches that economists have taken to uh, answering this question, let me just remind you about the uh, value-free character of economic theory. This is uh, something that's uh, not really very controversial among uh, economists. <coughs> Mainstream colleagues uh, tend to agree with us that um, economic theory is scientific. They have a different conception of what it is, as you've learned about this week, but uh, they don't really uh, contest this uh, claim. <coughs> so let's just start with a, a simple illustration of this, and then, again, you'll see that uh, <laughs> This, uh, this uh, constraint, if you will, on uh, economic reasoning provides certain problems for uh, advocating public policy. Okay, so let's just take a simple uh, illustration of uh, how we would think about uh, the value-free character of public policy. We say, um, you know, if the government erects a minimum wage above the market clearing wage, then this will result in, uh, you know, we can show through economic logic that this results in uh, unemployment. And this conclusion is uh, entirely value-free in the sense that uh, all we do is start with our beginning uh, uh, axioms and we, we uh, spin out the logic of demand and supply and market clearing prices and then we make an application to this particular case. And we haven't uh, interjected any ethical propositions in our reasoning process. And this is what we mean by value-free. We're just, we're just like uh, doctors doing scientific medicine. Right? And, but then the question uh, comes, uh, uh, how, how do we apply our knowledge? Or what happens when we apply our knowledge? Can we be value-free then? Um, okay, well, perhaps you can see again the problem. Uh, we can be value-free till the cows come home in doing our analysis, but when we want to make an application to some particular case, uh, it isn't obvious that we can retain our value-free status, right? We, we, it, seem, it would seem in my case of the uh, minimum wage, we would have to say something like, <clears throat> economic theory says we should not, um, or the government should not uh, erect the minimum wage, because if they do, it will cause unemployment. And so we're making an ethical judgment that unemployment is bad, but if there might be some people who think unemployment is good, or more likely, you know, labor unions who think that income transfers to them are good, and you know the unemployment of other people. Well, that's that's a unfortunate side effect of the benefit that we're getting. You know, too bad for you guys, but uh, we still think this is good public policy. So you can see the you can see the difficulty, right? The the interface between the ethical dimension uh, of advocating policy or justifying policy 
and the uh, uh, value-free character of economics. Okay, so let's uh, start then with the different approaches to welfare economics. We'll take uh, these six. These are, the, uh, for our purposes, the prominent uh, ones. So Mises has his own conception about how you might uh, undertake um, a justification of public policy. <coughs> uh, the classical economics had, uh, had a conception of how we might proceed uh, to answer this question. Uh, there was a school uh, in welfare economics called the Old Welfare Economics. It came about through the, uh, right at the beginning of the uh, marginalist revolution. And then the new welfare economics, it was based upon the emerging uh, neoclassical uh, synthesis of the uh, 1930s. Uh, then Rothbard famously posed his uh, welfare economics in, uh, in the 1950s. And the uh, most recent uh, mainstream treatment of uh, welfare economics is uh, sometimes called the compensation principle. So uh, we'll talk about these in turn. <clears throat> so let's begin with Mises. Uh, Mises takes this value-free uh, a framework. He says, look, uh, economics is, uh, economic theory is always within the ends means framework. Uh, as economists, what we're doing is uh, seeing what the causal relationships are between the means and the ends. And so we can do this in a value-free manner, just as uh, you know, scientific medicine finds out what uh, you know, causal uh, factors uh, create cancer or what have you. And then, uh, and this is all just pure science and value-free. Uh, so the economist can tell, uh, uh, can tell us what means are suitable to attain particular ends. And then Mises says, you know, for any particular end that someone would select then, the role of the economist would be, to, would be to say, look, these are the suitable means by which that end could be attained. That, that would be the role of the economist quo economist. <clears throat> okay, so how do, you, uh, how do you get from that uh, claim, again, which is kind of a standard claim in economic uh, theory, to uh, Mises' uh, justification for laissez-faire? How does he do this? <coughs> well, he makes, he makes one ethical claim, right? He says... Everyone shares the end of material well-being. Everyone, right, wants to have uh, material uh, goods, better and uh, more plentiful material goods. So that's his, his uh, starting point. That's his end, right? He says, look, in society, this is what we want. Everybody wants this. And... Uh, from that uh, claim, it's not too difficult to show that the means suitable to the attainment of the material well-being of everyone uh, is the market economy. So he gives his famous demonstration of the uh, you know, impossibility of um, economic calculation and socialism. So he shows that central planning can't provide us with a division of labor system by which material progress is forthcoming. And then, of course, he has to deal with the case of uh, intervention um, you know, I've summarized it here that interventionism impedes uh, material prosperity, but Mises' argument, uh, you may recall, is that um, any act of intervention on the part of the government uh, is either counterproductive to the ends, at least the ostensible ends to which it is being put. Like, again, uh, he gives the example of the milk market. He says, I suppose we have government officials and they say, uh, we want to make uh, milk uh, cheap and, and uh, available to the consumer. Right? So we place price controls on milk and economic theory can show that actually that makes the milk more scarce. Right? So, so it's counterproductive to the ostensible ends. And, and he says, look, any reasonable pe person then will just conclude that we, we shouldn't have price controls, right? If our end is to have more plentiful milk and and price controls give us less plentiful milk. Well, okay, so that's not a good public policy. We reject that. Uh, then he says there are other uh, interventions that are cumulative. They may not be counterproductive in and of themselves, but they accumulate in a way that the sponsors of, the, uh, of these interventions again say, wait a minute, I, you know, I didn't want that, right? I, didn't, uh, I can see now that this isn't a suitable means to attain my ends because of all these secondary effects. So the minimum wage, again, is a classic illustration of this. We have minimum wage, causes unemployment. You know, it does raise the wages of, certain, of a certain group, right? But 
uh, by excluding uh, 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 competition, the lower marginal revenue product workers. They become unemployed. Ooh, that's a problem. We don't, we don't want unemployment, right? And so now we have to do something about that, right? We have to intervene again. We have to come up with uh, transfer programs for the unemployed. This thing creates other problems. It, it takes uh, capital from the producers, and so it uh, you know, gives it to the non-producers, so it lowers the uh, capital accumulation process and makes us less wealthy, or at least not as wealthy as we would have been, and so on. And so again, he, he just says, look, a, a reasonable person who says, the end of, the, of having a minimum wage is to raise the income of you know, the working poor, if that's your end. You can see that you know, while it might appear that it does that initially, the secondary effects wash away this effect, right? They accumulate, and therefore we don't really get what we want in the end. So this is Mises' approach. Again, this is a this is a, a adequate, a logical approach, but uh, right. I mean, it's a perfectly fine argument that he makes. But remember, it does contain an ethical claim. Right? The the weakness in this argument with, with respect to can we have a purely scientific analysis of the state uh, from uh, from economic theory is that we made one one value judgment at the beginning. We said everyone shares the. Uh, uh, the end of having more material progress. Uh, well, that may not be the case, right? That's just, a, that's just an assumption, uh, uh, an ethical claim. <clears throat> okay, now, um, uh, the classical, econom uh, classical economists uh, did something different. Uh, they had a different approach to this uh, entire question. And what their um, uh, argument was is that what we ought to do to uh, you know, create the greatest uh, social welfare is uh, maximize physical output. <clears throat> Again, there's a certain superficial plausibility about this, right? We want uh, more and better material goods, better consumer goods, and, um, and more of them. And the way to do this is, uh, as they uh, argued, right? Adam Smith famously argued, the way to increase uh, production uh, in society is to extend the division of labor on the one hand, because when we extend the division of labor, we get the greater productivity of bringing into production, you know, relatively more efficient producers, right? So, so that would be a good idea: extend the division of labor. And the other is capital accumulation. Let's just, uh, right, we uh, uh, build more factories and, and equipment and uh, so on and so forth. So this was their, uh, you know, again, there's nothing uh, in economic theory uh, that contradicts this. This is a it's correct uh, theory to think that our production uh, increases and our material prosperity is greater if we extend the division of labor and, and we uh, accumulate capital. It was the policy end of this that, uh, uh, well, we might debate. Uh, okay, so again, it's one thing to say, as the classical economists did, that we ought to have free trade, free international trade, right? No trade barriers, no tariffs, and import quotas, and so on. Let's get rid of all that. That's, again, uh, fine. Uh, most economists would go along with this. Austrians certainly would. Uh, to say that a uh, regime of free trade will extend the division of labor, will bring uh, you know, all those uh, workers in China and India and every place in the world into the uh, world economy, and uh, everyone will, well, uh, the, the society as a whole in terms of the material goods produced will be richer, and uh, so this is a good thing. This is a, uh, you know, an adequate policy. <clears throat> now, uh, part of the problem, though, with the with the uh, a classical conception of this is, since they didn't base this upon subjective value, they, did, they, they just based it upon the physical, the physical production of goods, you could also have a policy justified, uh, something like uh, you know, gunboat policy, right? You could open up markets at gunpoint. This too would seem to be at least Possible under this uh, under this view, you could just have a policy where uh, England, let's say, uh, you know, threatens um, uh, Germany, uh, some German state, right, with uh, uh, with war, 
if they don't uh, open up their markets, if they don't drop their tariffs and so on and so forth. Now, I'm not saying that all classical economists held this view. I'm just saying if, if you say that uh, it's maximizing physical output that uh, you know, is the goal of welfare analysis, then you can, in fact, uh, get these policies that seem, uh, at least to us as Austrians, uh, questionable. Now, to go from the hypothetical, this free trade claim, to the actual uh, technological advance and capital accumulation were actual cases where the classical economists uh, advocated policies that went against the um, underlying private property system in, in the economy and advocated you know, capital accumulation, let's say, in Adam Smith, uh, by... Um, uh, invoking government policies, let's say credit expansion, monetary inflation, uh, or other such policies, let's say taking income from people who have uh, higher time preference and giving it to people who have lower time preference so the saving and investing would be stimulated by this, that those policies are also justified because, because the goal of having a policy is just to increase physical output. It's just to produce more and more stuff. Uh, and the same with technological advance. So the classical economists tended to be in favor of patents and copyrights and because they thought, now again here, uh, you know, as Stefan Kinsella has made clear, you, there's a question of the uh, economic uh, analysis, or the logical analysis of whether or not having a patent regime gives you more and better technology than, a, than an open system with no patents and so on. That, We'll set that question aside. I mean, we could do the analysis, right, and probably come down on the side of uh, no IP. But um, uh, but you can see the classical economists just just thought, look, if we if we have patents, then we'll subsidize the. Uh, it's perfectly okay to, for the government to subsidize the development of certain lines of technological improvement, precisely because they thought. It, uh, uh, Public policy can be justified if it maximizes physical output. <clears throat> okay, so uh, so that was the class. Now, uh, by the way, I should mention that the this classical notion that we have some sort of uh, some sort of object that we're going to maximize as the goal of uh, policy that lies outside the realm of subjective concerns of welfare itself, right, of human well-being itself. Um, the classical economists are not the only group of economists who hold this. As we'll see, the, the advocates of the compensation principle do the same thing. They don't, they don't argue for maximizing physical output. They argue for maximizing the monetary value of assets. And this is just an objective uh, uh, cri criterion like the classical economists. It's, it's not necessarily connected to subjective value. You have to assume a whole bunch of other things <laughs> in order to have monetary values connected to subjective values. We'll, we'll see how they grapple with this in, when we get to them. Okay, now let's take the old wel welfare economics. Old welfare economics, uh, as I said, came about uh, in the wake of the marginalist revolution. So economists could no longer ignore subjective value. I mean, if you're going to do welfare economics, you can talk about well-being, it would seem that uh, the value that people place upon different goods would somehow enter into the analysis. Again, this is sort of assumed when you talk about maximizing physical output, right? The uh, classical economists were not just talking about like, building pyramids or, you know, having physical stuff. They sort of took for granted or Im implicitly assumed that this stuff would be valuable to people. So the old welfare economists made this explicit. These are guys like Edg Edgeworth and Pigou. And uh, they, uh, their uh, goal then for uh, uh, public policy was to maximize social utility, where they conceived of social utility as, a, as the sum of individual utility. You could add it up. You could uh, have cardinal expressions of utility. Or if you didn't have cardinal expressions of utility, uh, you could have monetary proxies for utility, which were addable, you know, summable, and uh, therefore you could you could uh, tell when uh, utility, social utility as the sum of individual utility was rising or falling. Uh, their classic uh, public policy uh, was income redistribution. They said, look, uh, there's diminishing marginal utility of, of money or money assets. 
And so a poor person has a higher marginal utility of, of money than a rich person. The rich person has much more money or more money assets. And so the, sum, the aggregate sum of their, of their utilities would rise if we just take income from the rich guy and give it to the poor guy. And that, was, that was one of their prominent uh, policies. Right? So here's a, you're justifying this particular public policy on the grounds that it maximizes or brings about greater uh, uh, social utility. Now, uh, again, the problems with this are fairly obvious, and we won't belabor them. Uh, uh, the economic theoretical uh, problem is, of course, that if you, if you initiate this kind of mass transfer right, from the rich to the poor, you'll destroy the whole, uh, the whole pr uh, uh, market process of production. Right? Again, you decapitalize the productive people, and you, and you uh, subsidize the uh, unproductive people. Uh, and therefore, the productivity of society overall would collapse, and uh, this this wouldn't lead to greater social utility, right? It's, it's uh, uh, the dynamic process of that's set in motion by this kind of massive intervention would uh, would not lead us to desirable uh, consequences. Uh, but the thing that it, it, that particular argument was not uh, the determining factor in overthrowing this view. Uh, what overthrew this view was the um, a demonstration by Pareto and Robbins that uh, in scientific economic theorizing, we, we cannot make interpersonal utility comparisons. It's, it's certainly true that everybody has diminishing marginal utility of money, but, but that, uh, that, uh, that's not the same thing as claim, claiming that the marginal utility for a, let's say an additional thousand dollars to a poor person is greater than the marginal utility of an additional thousand dollars to a rich person. We know we know only what's going on. Marginal utility only tells us what's going on in the mind of any particular person. But the subjectivity of value does not permit us to interpersonally compare utility. Right. So all economists then accepted. Well, mainstream economists accepted this view, and the old welfare theory went out went out the window. It was just abandoned. And uh, in its place, uh, we got uh, new welfare economics. <clears throat> and new welfare economics uh, adopted the Pareto rule. And they took a particular uh, variation of the Pareto rule uh, that uh, in the literature is called Pareto optimality. And we'll go through the conditions of Pareto optimality one by one uh, just to see just to show you that this is uh, oh, well, it's a, <laughs> dependent upon the conception of modeling that the uh, neoclassical economists have. But, <clears throat> but anyway, uh, there are some affinities here between the, the new uh, welfare economics and Rothbard's approach, so we don't want to miss those as well. So the Pareto rule says this, that uh, if an interaction in society, any social interaction, makes one person worse off, then any judgment concerning the social welfare consequences requires an ethical rule, requires that we interpersonally compare utility. We say this guy's utility is more important than that guy's. That was uh, the source of the Pareto rule. So notice, uh, for a social interaction to increase social welfare, so to speak, uh, it has to make at least one person better off and no one worse off. Now, again, it's admitted by the, by the uh, new welfare economists that uh, all voluntary exchange does this. Right? So the market does this, right? Uh, the normal process of the market. So in a voluntary exchange, the two parties benefit, or if there are you know, multiple parties to the trade, they all benefit, uh, and none of them is, none of them is uh, you know, made worse off, because, uh, because otherwise they would withdraw, right? Uh, so there's this voluntary character of, uh, of exchange. Now, uh, so I'm just using that as an example, and again, there's an affinity between that kind of claim and the claim that uh, Rothbardians make in, uh, in Rothbard's version of, uh, Rothbard's version also uses the Pareto rule. <coughs> uh, 
Okay, but let, so let's go on now to their conception of how you get, um, how you apply value-free economic theorizing here. And then as a conclusion from your analysis, you, you're able to say good public policy, you know, proper public policy, the government should do X. This is, this is good public policy. <clears throat> it's justified by our economic value-free analysis. Okay, so this is in the perfectly competitive general equilibrium. And so for those of you who haven't you know, studied economics, I'm going to sort of require you to at least see this one time. This is what uh, you would be taught in a mainstream program. This is how economics is done uh, uh, in the mainstream. So first we start with certain, uh, remember this is a model, okay? So, uh, so the standard uh, approach by mainstream economists is to say, you know, the real world is too messy for us to really analyze uh, empirically uh, with just uh, sort of straightforward uh, uh, complexity of reality. So what we have to do is construct simplified models. And then, and then, and then the model will spin out uh, empirically testable hypotheses that we can then use empirical data to uh, falsify. And if we falsify, then we can adjust our model accordingly and then you know, get closer and closer to having it describe or predict uh, a reality. Okay, so the model first in includes economic agents, not human beings, but economic agents. And these economic agents have, uh, well, we make uh, certain assumptions about their motivations and about their abilities as, uh, as actors. Uh, so the motivational assumptions are, first of all, all of the, all of the agents in the model uh, as consumers are able to maximize their utility uh, subject to uh, market constraints. So they have a utility function um, and they have uh, uh, you know, prices of goods that are given and income that they possess. And uh, those of you studying economics have seen this, right? It's in difference curve analysis. So here we get... Uh, uh, utility maximization, uh, where, as we say, the marginal rate of substitution uh, is equal to the price, uh, price uh, ratio for each consumer. The entrepreneurs maximize profit. They do this in the iso-quant, iso-cost arena for use of the factors of production. They decide on how much labor and capital to use in combination to produce a good. Again, based upon the uh, uh, production relationship, you know, they maximize production for a given constraint that they face, the prices of the uh, inputs and the amount of uh, income that they have to uh, spend. <coughs> uh, and then they maximize, pro they, they also have the consideration of maximizing profit means producing efficiently and then producing what people want. So they have, right, so there's a second condition where they have to produce, this is the Marginal rate of transformation is equal to the marginal rate of substitution. I'll get to the technical part of this in a minute. Uh, where, where those have to be equal. They have to produce exactly the right amount of stuff of each good, the right amount of each good uh, that is being demanded by the consumers. Okay, and, and then producers, people as producers, or the agents as producers, maximize income. So they're subject to this process too, right? They d allocate their income according to where their monetary income or monetary compensation would be the greatest. So there are those motivational assumptions, right? We have agents, and they're uh, you know, capable of doing the maximizing calculus. And uh, they're motivated in, in strictly in these, uh, in these ways. Uh, then there are certain market conditions that are assumed. This, again, is order, in order to have an, a nice, uh, tractable model. Uh, certain assumptions are made about the market. Uh, these are the perfectly competitive assumptions. Maybe you've heard this list, but... Uh, there are things like in every market, there are many uh, buyers and sellers, many small buyers and sellers. So no one of them uh, can set price. They're, they're just uh, price takers. Uh, the goods are all homogeneous. All, all sellers sell homogeneous goods, no product differentiation. Right? Every, everyone's just selling um, you know, uh, exactly identical or at least interchangeably useful uh, units of goods. Resource mobility is costless, so it's possible to move for the producers to move resources without cost. Uh, they have perfect information, so they're not in the dark about demands and market conditions and so on. 
Now, uh, given these uh, conditions as background, and, and there are also some conditions about production relationships and the concavity conditions of utility function, right? So there's a whole bunch of technical stuff I won't go into. Uh, but given these uh, uh, assumptions, then uh, the uh, model, we're able to construct a, a formal model with mathematical equations that we can solve for its general equilibrium uh, outcome, right? We can simultaneously solve all the equations, all the labor and capital uh, uses in the production of every good, uh, all the different amounts of every good produced, all the different trade that would take place, uh, the, at the prices at which every, all of this would occur, and so on. So everything could fall out from general equilibrium. Now, the, the, here's where we're starting to get now to the technical part that I put up on the slide. In order for there to be, and again, I'm, uh, I'm doing this, I want to run through this, as I said before, in part because there's some affinities here with the way that Austrians think about, about social interaction as well. So we shouldn't lose those. We shouldn't just think, oh, you know, the model is just, just a heap of trash and uh, uh, these guys are just all wet. I mean, they are wet, but they're not all wet, right? They got something going on here that uh, Austrians would also uh, uh, consent to, right? It would uh, incorporate in their own analysis. And, and uh, again, again, you've heard this uh, principle before uh, during the week. Uh, this is the idea that if they're, if they're unequal values, if people in their heads hold valuations for different goods that are uh, unequal, significantly unequal, they can engage in exchange. And as they engage in exchange, since they have diminishing marginal utility for the two goods they're trading, their marginal utilities come together, right? And they come together to the point where they stop trading, they're at a plain state of rest. So that, that really is true, right? We really do have these arbitrage processes in the real world where you know, if the price of oil, uh, spot price of oil today in trading in London is $150 uh, a barrel and in New York is 100 well, then it really is true that the traders would jump in, right, and arbitrage away this difference. They would, you know, uh, uh, buy the uh, oil cheaply in New York and then resell it immediately in London where its price was high. And by doing so, they would bring, they would eliminate the differences in prices. You eliminate the differences in marginal utilities. So there is this process that's, that's being undertaken in markets all the time. Uh, what What's wrong with the modeling of this, of course, is that what we've done is this kind of functional analysis where we not only have this process of arbitrage, moving goods from lesser value to higher value users and then eliminating the price difference, but we, get, we have to get to solve the model a uh, single solution where we get equality of all these things, right? Where everything is equalized. There can't be any, any differential between utility values or technically speaking, marginal rates of substitution, uh, or price, uh, prices that exist in different markets, or profitability opportunities, and so on and so forth. We have to squeeze out every possible value differential that might exist among the agents and among the producers and so on in the market in order to get a solution, a, a tractable solution in the model. So the marginal rate of substitution has to be equal for all consumers. Marginal rate of substitution is the amount of Y that a person is willing to give up in order to obtain another unit of X. It's the rate of, at which they're willing to exchange the physical amounts of goods. Uh, in, in the marginal rate of technical substitution, the next line down has to be equal in the production for all goods. This is labor and capital. So every entrepreneur who's using a certain type of labor and a certain type of capital in production uh, has to bring the uh, tra trade off, the rate at which they're trading off capital for labor in the production process into equality with the rate that's being traded off in every other production process. So the marginal rate of technical substitution again is how much capital can be surrendered in a production process uh, per unit of labor, leaving the production you know, intact. So it'd be something like uh, a home construction company. Uh, uh, getting rid of a backhoe and replacing the backhoe with six workers to dig ditches, right? That would be the marginal rate of technical substitution. One, one backhoe for 
six units of labor. All those ratios have to be equal everywhere in all production processes that use the same, the same output, the same, I mean, uh, inputs uh, to produce whatever output it is they're producing. Okay, and then the marginal rate of transformation, the bottom, the third point there, the marginal rate of transformation equal to the marginal rate of substitution, th uh, that's the principle that uh, brings production in line with, with consumption or with demand. So the marginal rate of substitution, again, is, is consumer utility. And the marginal rate of transformation is the uh, production relationships by which Y can be traded for X. The two goods can be traded for each other, right? We can, we can take labor and capital and transfer them into uh, more production of Y, but only by suffering a, redu a reduced production of X. So that's the marginal rate of transformation. And only when those two things are equal will we have you know, squeezed out all possible beneficial arbitrage opportunities. If we value X relative to Y as consumers more highly than the physical processes, more highly than the ratio of the physical processes of production, then, then we can make further substitutions of uh, production in certain goods in order to get a greater, uh, uh, greater utility. We can, we can move to higher indifference curves by moving from one point to another on the production possibilities frontier, for those of you who you know, know about the technical aspects of this, right? until the marginal rate of transformation, the slope of the production possibilities frontier, is equal to the marginal rate of substitution, the slope of our indifference curve, right? well, for every consumer. Right? So that's the conception that's going on here. Now, why, uh, what happens in the market? How, so that's just the notion of what would happen in the model, right, when we solve the model. But now the question is, what, what about the market? Does the market bring about this general equilibrium? So that, that's the next question, right? Does the unimpeded market, the unhampered market, bring about general equilibrium? And the answer is yes, according to the assumptions that we made undergirding this model, the uh, market would, in fact, bring about a general equilibrium. Why is this true? Because every, go back on the slide, every um, consumer maximizes his or her utility by equating the marginal rate of substitution, the rate at which they're willing to trade goods, uh, Y for X, uh, it, uh, they, they equate that to the price ratio. But the price ratio in perfectly competitive markets will be the same for all consumers, right? Well, there won't be any divergence between the price of X that, all the, that each consumer is paying and the price of Y that each consumer is paying and so on. So this gives us, okay, the market's good here. It's efficient. Uh, same condition would exist for technical production. <laughs> All the entrepreneurs are saying, paying the same price ratio for labor and capital, and so they, they'll bring their production relationships into line with this. They'll adjust their methods of production so that the rate at which they're trading off capital for labor will be exactly equal to the rate at which it can be bought and sold in the market. They'll all do this. So they all equate their marginal rates of technical uh, substitution with all the other producers. And then the same thing for the marginal rate of transformation, marginal rate of substitution. These two things will be equalized in the market because profit maximization requires that the price of each good be equal to its marginal cost. Again, this is a technical condition. We won't go into the details of it. But if that's true, then the marginal rate of transformation, which is the marginal cost of X over the marginal cost of Y, it's just the ratio of marginal costs, will be equal to the ratio of prices. Uh, P sub X divided by P sub Y. So that would have to be true too in the market, right? Because all profit maximizing entrepreneurs will bring price of X and marginal cost of X into equality. When they do this, then obviously for every good, the, when we do ratios, the price of X over the price of Y would be equal to the marginal cost of X over the marginal cost of Y, right? And so on and so forth. So, so this, is, this is great, right? We, the model has shown that uh, so far that we can have uh, we can have laissez-faire, or that the market produces these these uh, results. Okay, so what room does this leave for public policy in the in the general equilibrium conception? And surprisingly, given this demonstration, surprisingly the answer is quite a bit, quite a bit of room. Uh, for one thing, um, again, let me rely on some of the technical apparatus that. Those of you studying economics already know, 
there can be the, this perfectly competitive general equilibrium point will exist for every, for every single point on the uh, production possibilities frontier. Every point is uh, or uh, con contains the conditions of a perfectly competitive general equilibrium. So, so somebody has to choose which point we wind up on. I mean, that's a choice variable uh, as far as the mainstream economists are concerned. Now, notice they don't want to say, though, let's erect a social welfare function by which we can decide, right, by, by which the government or uh, government officials could decide, you, you, know, uh, let, uh, you know, whether we should produce more of X or more of Y, which gives, which would shift utility from one group to another, right? Because then they're making interpersonal utility comparisons. So they don't want to say that. What they do say, this is uh, their attempt at being clever to get around the problem of interpersonal utility comparisons. They say, the government can establish, you know, on the basis of value-free scientific economics, they can establish initial endowments of income. So we're back to income redistribution. They think that, uh, you know, if the government, um, uh, redistributes income that this does not involve interpersonal utility comparisons. Again, I'd say that's uh, perhaps uh, debatable, let's say. Okay, but more importantly uh, for public policy, what the uh, advocates of this kind of modeling approach uh, suggest is that there can be market failures. And so again, those of you studying economics, you know that uh, market failure literature is a, is a, is a cottage industry, right? I mean, it's just Everything is a market failure. Uh, you can you can construct. I've constructed kind of a perfect model, sort of a basic, simple model, right? But you can you can reconstruct the models in order to just create market failures of various types and and so on. And then and then say, oh look, the government can intervene to correct the market failure. That's not that that's just purely scientific, value-free economics. We're not making any value judgments. We're just saying, look, uh, there's a, there's an inefficiency here, and the government can just so it's was proper policy for the government to step in and correct it. So you get things like, uh, well, the absence of perfect competition that is a classic case of this, right? What if we have some monopoly power by certain firms? Well, then, uh, then uh, they'll set their profit maximizing point where price is greater than marginal cost. This means that there's a certain amount of production that would be efficient to produce. It would satisfy higher valued uh, consumer demands, but the monopolist won't produce it. And therefore, the government's justified in breaking up the monopoly or regulating it or, okay, you get this kind of a claim. Uh, product differentiation would do this. Lack of perfect information would leave, you know, a value gaps between I don't know about you, but you have a good that if I did know about you, you would, you know, we could have mutual trade with your goods and my goods, but we don't know the existence of each other or that these uh, possibilities exist. So the government is supposed to be justified in somehow providing us with this information. Right. And, then, and then so that we can improve our trades. Uh, transaction costs, huge literature on transaction costs, right? How they, how the government can manage transaction costs because transaction costs, again, create price gaps, right? If there are transaction costs in shipping oil, let's say, between two points, the price differential between these two points can be uh, maintained. And so allegedly the government can step in and magically you know, reduce these transaction costs somehow and lead to more trade and greater benefit and, uh, and so on. Uh, there are externalities you've heard about in other lectures uh, this week. Uh, benefits or costs that are uh, generated by the private parties involved in uh, production and exchange uh, that, are, that, that accrue to third parties that, that aren't included in the in the production decisions right, of the people generating these externalities. And therefore, social welfare can be improved if somehow the government steps in and you know, uh, uh, forces people to uh, take into account these benefits and costs. So uh, you know, somebody has a garden. My wife uh, has a garden, flower garden, and it's really spectacular. And everybody who drives by the house gets this external benefit. And so in order to have uh, efficient production of the of the uh, of the garden. The, these people who are passing by, who value the garden, would have to be forced to pay my wife to produce more of the good, right? That because because we we have an inefficiency here, according to the model, 
Uh, and external costs would be the opposite, right? External costs, the government would have to step in and force the, uh, uh, the person creating the external cost to bear the cost uh, and therefore reduce production to get the efficient amount. We get public goods, another famous uh, case, right, that are non-rival and non-exclusive uh, in, uh, in consumption. And so here the government has a role to produce the public good because private enterprise won't do this. It lies outside of this profit-maximizing calculus. Um, now, uh, the, the uh, perhaps criticisms of this uh, approach are fairly uh, apparent, but let me just run down some of the main ones. Uh, first, this whole notion of functional analysis we've uh, criticized before, right? It, uh, Mises makes a great uh, point against this by saying that um, in human action, there are no constants. And therefore, anytime we attempt to do functional analysis, we, we're stymied, right? Because to write a function, or at least a function where we can solve for actual empirical <laughs> results, we have to have constants and variables. Functions always have constants and variables, like the consumption function, right? A plus B times Y. It's, it's constants, the A and the B, and variables, the Y and the C. Well, okay, if, if, if there aren't any constants in human action, you can't write functions and you can't do functional analysis. You can't solve models and so on and so forth, right? Um, <clears throat> uh, Harold Demsit, the, uh, the uh, famous uh, UCLA economist, uh, pointed out that this whole, this whole project of uh, saying, let's erect a model and then if the real world deviates from the model, we'll call that a market failure and justify the government you know, intervening to correct, to correct this failure. He called this the nirvana fallacy, very famously. And so uh, this is certainly correct, right? This, is a, this whole approach suffers from some kind of uh, strange uh, logical disconnect. You know, so, so what if the model has these features? How does that justify public policy in the real world? Uh, and, but the one that I want to uh, mention before we go on to the Austrian uh, Rothbard's conception is that <clears throat> this whole uh, way of uh, approaching welfare economics uh, is what we might call end state analysis, right? This is Pareto optimality. We, we reach the end state, the general equilibrium end state, and we say that is a perfectly adjusted, you know, perfectly efficient uh, situation. And if the real world deviates at all from this end state, this optimal situation that's created by the general equilibrium process, then the government can intervene to move the real world toward that end state. And we'll see this is not the only uh, way of conceiving of uh, 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 per, uh, the Pareto rule. <clears throat> okay, so now let's turn to uh, Rothbard. Rothbard, as I suggested, has a different notion of the Pareto rule. <clears throat> And we might call this dynamic, or again, to keep in uh, sync with the uh, terminology of this literature, we would call this Pareto superiority as, a pre as opposed to Pareto optimality. But Pareto superiority just says that in each social interaction, we can judge on the basis of the Pareto rule whether or not this social interaction uh, increases social welfare. We can. And so we can just proceed step by step, each action at a time, right? Saying, yes, this action uh, would increase social welfare according to the Pareto rule, this one would not, and, and so on and so forth. So we can just have a, a dynamic application of the Pareto rule. And again, uh, we call this uh, Pareto uh, superior, uh, superiority. Okay, so how does Rothbard proceed? Uh, you'll find this uh, in his famous article he wrote in the 1950s toward a reconstruction of utility and welfare economics. And then uh, Professor Hoppe has also done work on this um, conception of welfare economics. Okay, so we start with self-owned labor. Each person, right, is a, a, in fact an owner of their uh, body, their mind and body. So from that beginning point, which again is not an ethical claim, but a, uh, just a, a claim, but, you know, just a claim about the world as it is, a descriptive claim. <clears throat> uh, we just apply the Pareto rule to every action that people would take uh, uh, as they uh, you know, begin to live their lives. So we have this person, and this person is a, it starts with self-owned labor. Uh, in order to uh, you know, sustain himself, he, he would then uh, appropriate uh, uh, 
uh, property out of nature. You would appropriate natural resources, property acquisition, as I called it on the slide. Every time, as Hoppe puts it, every time a person takes his uh, labor, which he owns, and he acquires a natural resource with it, he's demonstrating his, his utility. Right? So he's made better off. No one else is demonstrably worse off because everybody else is doing something else. Everybody else is demonstrating their preference for doing something else. They're not preempting this guy, right, by, by, by getting to this natural resource first and homesteading it for themselves. And so no one is made worse off. No one is made demonstrably worse off uh, in any act of uh, property, ac any voluntary act of property acquisition. The same then would follow with production. So uh, let me give you a concrete hypothetical case. Let's suppose in um, 1700, we have a guy uh, and his family who live in, uh, uh, I don't know, on the East Coast, <clears throat> Philadelphia or wherever, and they decide to heck with this. We're, we're going to uh, move west and uh, you know, establish our own, our, we're going to live on our own, right? It's our own little community. And so they trek west and they come all the way, let's say, to Illinois. And they find the you know this virgin territory, no Indians, no white, no Frenchmen, no right. They're just by themselves. And so they, they you know cut down the trees and they build a log cabin, right? They go through this process of homesteading. They bring the land in, into production. They plow it and uh, and so on and so forth. The, the, the uh, Austrian conception of welfare theory would say, well, look, you know these guys are made better off by these actions. No one else is demonstrably worse off, right? No, one, no, one, no one's worse off that they're doing this because in order to demonstrate that they'd be worse off, the person who claims to be worth, worse off would have to preempt this homesteader, would have to have gotten there first, right, and said, no, I want this land, and you know, I'm going to homestead it before you. That would be a demonstration of their greater utility. But what are they actually doing? Well, they're actually you know, sitting in counting houses in Philadelphia, or they're, you know, uh, they're being a blacksmith, and some little town in uh, Massachusetts or whatever. Okay, then, then uh, so one, once the person has natural resources, he engages in acts of production, same, the same logic, right? So we have our homesteading family, they create a corn uh, crop, and the corn cr crop they uh, produce, right, by the application of their labor with natural resources. And this demonstrably increases their utility without demonstrably any decreasing the utility of anybody else, right? Because everybody else was doing something that they valued more. They weren't, they weren't right, uh, interfering somehow to show that they valued not a corn crop but a wheat crop more than the corn crop or whatever, uh, and so on. Then once, he, once the guy has the corn, he can trade it with someone else. When he engages in a trade with someone else, both parties benefit. No one is demonstrably worse off because, again, they're choosing to do something else. They're, they're demonstrating their preference to do something else, right? So they're, they're better off by their actions doing something else as opposed to attempting to preempt this exchange. So, and so on. So we see that every act of acquisition, production, transfer, of voluntary acts are uh, Pareto superior. Right? Every act on the unhampered market then is Pareto superior. It's just a dynamic process where step by step, uh, social welfare is going up little by little, right? Every time people engage in these actions. Now, if we think about the state, every time the state intervenes, we've got aggression. We've got an act of aggression against a person or property. <clears throat> and uh, an act of aggression then fails the Pareto rule. It doesn't pass the Pareto test, right? Because one party's made better off, but another party's made worse off. And since someone's made worse off, we can't say that social uh, welfare has improved. We're, we're, scientifically speaking, we're lost to say so. So we can just say, well, look, no act of government is Pareto superior. No act of government can increase social welfare, right? Every act on the unhampered market increases social welfare, and no act of the state can increase social welfare. This is how the argument runs. <clears throat> okay, so that's the Rothbardian theory. So this is a justification, right, of pure laissez-faire. No, no government uh, act could be uh, justified on the grounds of this, of this kind of approach. Uh, now let's do the compensation principle, the last. Uh, again, you'll see some affinities as we move back and forth between these things. 
So the comp compensation principle, as I mentioned before, uh, takes as its goal to uh, of uh, you know maximize or of uh, creating social welfare is to maximize uh, monetary wealth, to maximize the monetary value of assets. That as opposed to the classical economist, which said, let's maximize physical output, the amount of goods or the quality of the goods that we have. The, the uh, compensation principle says, let's just maximize monetary income, or, or again, mon technically monetary wealth. And <clears throat> they do this, uh, well, their uh, rule is not the Pareto rule. Remember, the Pareto rule says that any interaction between parties that makes one party worse off uh, cannot increase social welfare. Right? It, we, we, just, we, we can't tell because we have to make an interpersonal utility comparison to be able to tell if social welfare, so to speak, has gone up. And so the compensation principle tries to get around this. They try to get around this restriction of the Pareto rule by saying, well, uh, the Calder formula for this is to say, if an, if an interaction, what if we have an interaction where those who, it's true that one party gains and another loses, but what if we could demonstrate that the party that gains could make a monetary compensation to the party that loses, and the party that loses would still be better off after the, after the compensation? Th then wouldn't it be okay? And th wouldn't that satisfy uh, the the uh, the underlying uh, notion behind the Pareto rule. Now you'll notice a key uh, key element of this Calder criterion is that the compensation isn't actually paid. The, the idea, the claim is that if the winners could compensate the losers, then the action increases social welfare. Just if they could potentially compensate them then it would be okay. Notice, it, if, if the compensation were actually paid, this would just, this would just uh, revert to the Pareto rule, right? E everybody would be a winner, and we, we just have the same thing as the Pareto rule. So, so the Calder-Hicks criteria is an attempt to, again, uh, get around the restriction of the Pareto rule by trying to find instances where, when they're winners and losers, the winners would be able, with their greater monetary wealth from winning, to compensate the losers who, whose monetary wealth is reduced. Okay, the Hicks criteria, uh, you might imagine that there's a, one of the problems involved in this is that it, since income is being redistributed in the winner-loser uh, interaction, you, you, don't, you, you don't get a reversible process necessarily, right? The process isn't you can't back it out the other way because income's been redistributed. Once you do the, you know, once you go through the process where someone loses and another guy wins, now the winner has more income and the loser less. And if you tried to reverse the process to show that you had a, like a logically transitive action here, you, well, sometimes it would work and sometimes it wouldn't. And so that's why you get the Hicks part of this. The Hicks rule says, that uh, the absence of an interaction would improve social welfare uh, if those who lose could compensate those who gain and still be better off. Right? So you're not going to do those things where the, the person who would lose is able to compensate the person who wins and still be, and uh, the, uh, both parties would still then be better off. It, so if you can, if you can uh, have both the Calder and the Hicks condition met at the same time, then you, you avoid at least uh, some of these logical difficulties. Okay, well, what does all this have to do with uh, policy? Well, the policy then would be to have just cost-benefit analysis. This is where you get cost-benefit analysis, right? You just have government officials and they, they decide, oh, this is the monetary benefit of policy X and this is the monetary cost. These are the guys who are gonna lose and these are the guys who, who will win. And the monetary gain by the winners is greater than the monetary loss by the, by the losers. Now, perhaps you can see the, the problems involved in this. Uh, the first problem we might mention is that you, you can't even apply the Calder-Hicks rule to actual social interactions. And the reason is you have no demonstration of the you know, willingness to 
be compensated by the losers. You have no idea, in other words, whatsoever, how much the losers would have to be compensated in order for them to say, yes, yes, go ahead and do this. There's no, no demonstration whatsoever of, of, right, of what, these, uh, what the monetary value, what their willingness to pay would be uh, to uh, absorb this loss. Uh, secondly, the bureaucrats, of course, of the government can't compare all the different policy options. Again, if we think about their situation with respect to, let's say, market entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs in the market have economic calculation. They can then engage in appraisement, right? And they can know then, or you know, have reasonable expectations about what sort of course of action they should take. You know, I should produce this good to the exclusion of that one because it's, it'll generate more social benefit than if I produce the second good. But the bureaucrats have no idea whatsoever. Right? They have no guide uh, to what, uh, what should or should not be produced. So they lack uh, economic, the, the apparatus of economic calculation. They have prices and so on, but they lack what the entrepreneur has, right, in uh, engaging in, in the appraisement process of economic calculation. Monetary values themselves are just empty. The entrepreneur is putting his own wealth at risk in this process and bringing forth, right, through his own, his own effort, uh, th this one line of production as, as opposed to this one. Whereas the bureaucrats just sitting back and saying, yeah, yeah, you know, if we let the... Uh, the uh, forest uh, uh, be uh, assigned to the uh, developers. They'll cut the trees, and that'll be worth more than the, you know these environmentalist wackos just wandering around on the trails. So, well, let's go for that. That's that sounds good to me, right? That's totally different. It's not. There's nothing uh, scientific about this. And then finally, let me mention that the, uh, it's a great point that Rothbard made. Uh, the Calder-Hicks rule actually uh, makes an implicit uh, value judgment in favor of the status quo. For example, what if we had slavery, a system of slavery already in place? And we asked the, you know, the, the Hicks uh, criterion or the Calder criterion, well, okay, uh, no, we probably wouldn't be able to get rid of it, right? It would probably pass the Calder-Hicks rule. Um, Ed, Ed Stringham gives this example. He says, uh, what if you have a, a rich person, a really rich person, and a really poor person who doesn't have any money at all, wouldn't it be possible under Calder Hicks for the rich guy just to kill the poor guy? I mean, if he gets value from doing it, right? Be because the poor guy doesn't have any money to, right, to make the compensate. There's not, he's not able to. Okay, he's doomed. So, so this shows you what we, what I pointed out at the very beginning when we talked about the classical school. This, this Calder Hicks, this compensation principle, is not actually connected to the private property structure of real life, right? It's just, it's just like the, you know, producing whatever you want, right? Let's maximize the production of physical things. Let's just predict, you know, produce a, a bricks or, or pyramids or something of the sort. And that's supposed to pass the social welfare test. So we have a similar kind of problem here. Okay, sorry I went a little over, but uh, yeah.